Okay, so that's all I want to say though about this uh, proof checking mentality, and we'll get back to just thinking about um, CSPs. So one thing I want to say is that it's not important that the CSP here that we're talking about is three coloring. That's just like I chose it for convenience, but you could have any other CSP, non-trivial CSP here and get like an essentially a similar result. So every time I say the PCP theorem in previous lectures, I actually stated it for like three sad or max three sad instead of max three coloring, but it's equivalent. And I'll show you one direction of the equivalence or sketch one direction of the equivalence. Let's say you wanted the exact same theorem, but like you wanted to be talking about max three sat here instead. So to conclude that it's hard to distinguish between the case of a perfectly satisfiable three CNF and the three CNF where like the best assignment satisfies at most 99% of the clauses. Well, what you can do is first get this PCP theorem about three coloring. And then we know from, you know, our undergraduate days, our textbooks, that there's like a, you know, a many one polynomial time reduction mapping three colorable, three colorability to three sat. That's just by virtue of the fact these are both NP-complete problems. But, uh, okay, so this takes a graph and outputs like a three CNF phi. But what you can also observe if you take a look at the reduction in the textbook is that it's a particular kind of reduction like a gadget reduction, which basically means like given the graph G, you make a three CNF where like for every vertex in G, you like kind of encode it by like one or two or three variables in your phi. And then for every edge or every constraint in the graph, you kind of convert that edge to like three or six or eight or something, uh, you know, three CNF clauses. In such a way that you really like, uh, there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence between assignments and colorings and like, you know, the constraint that the two colors on an edge are different and like the satisfiability of like these eight gadget clauses you introduce. Point being that like on one hand, if you have like a perfectly three colorable graph, this reduction produces a perfectly satisfiable three CNF formula. But, and I, I leave this as an exercise, uh, you can conclude that if the, if the graph is not just not three colorable, but has badness at least some epsilon zero, then the badness of phi will be, I don't know, like at least epsilon zero over eight or 10 or 20 or over some constant. Okay, and the point is like, uh, you just have to observe from the reduction that like, if you had some assignment to phi, you could translate it back to like a coloring for G. And this coloring for G, you know, if you're in the case where G is not satisfiable, you know, has to violate at least an epsilon zero fraction of the edges. And then for each violated edge, edge you can infer that at least one of the associated three CNF clauses would also have to be unsatisfied by your, the sign that you started with. So basically for every unsatisfied edge in G, you get like one out of eight or one out of 10 or something unsatisfied clauses in phi. Okay, so this epsilon zero goes down by a constant, but you know, you can pass from one constant to another. Okay, and basically this holds, it sort of formally holds by the dichotomy theorem for any um, CSP that's NP hard. There's a gadget reduction between any two CSPs that are NP hard and therefore this kind of translation holes, just this constant epsilon zero might change. Okay, but you know, for simplicity, we're gonna formally stick with three coloring in this lecture. I also wanna mention that it's, there's nothing special about starting with circuits at here. This is just an NP completeness result or NP hardness result. So you could have started with any, I mean, the PCP theorem would be equivalent if you put any NP complete or NP hard problem on the left-hand side here, instead of circuit sat. Um, just because, you know, it's, you know, NP hardness results, it doesn't matter what NP complete problem you start with. In particular, I'll make a funny observation, which is one NP complete problem we know is three colorability, but like the classic version of just trying to distinguish three colorable versus -three, non-three colorable. So you could put three set here, but, you know, as I said, you could also put three coloring, which would be kind of amusing. In fact, that's what we'll do. This is like the final form of the PCP theorem that we'll prove. We'll show that there's a, well, sketch that there's a polynomial time reduction from three colorability to three colorability, like from graphs to graphs, um, but with this sort of property that it's sort of um, badness amplifying. So, uh, you know, if you take a, a graph G that's three colorable, the, and pass it through the reduction, you get another three colorable graph, but you take a graph that's just not three colorable, but maybe it's almost three colorable, you get a graph that's sort of far from three colorable. Okay, so this is the inherent nature of the PCP theorem. Okay, or to just summarize the notation, it looks like this. 
Uh, okay. And now I'm just going to make one small observation that like if you have a graph G with N vertices and M edges, to say that the badness is at least zero is equivalent to say that it's at least one over M. That's a very trivial comment. It's just that like if you have a graph that's not three colorable, it means that every three coloring of the vertices must make monochrome at least one edge, which is a one over M fraction of all edges. Okay, so this is really, uh, if you phrase it in this way, it's really like a badness amplification theorem. Um, so uh, in Rita Neurs proof, she, you know, she used the term gap instead of badness. It's a slightly stater thing. And she called her, her proof like a proof by gap amplification. And this is uh, how Neurs proof goes and how I'll sketch it to you. Um, I know like when uh, Irit, uh, you know, sometimes gives a talk about this um, result, she uses this analogy. You see, the reduction has to transform a graph into another graph in polynomial time, uh, such that if like it's slightly not three colorable, it becomes highly not three colorable. But if it's is three colorable, it stays three colorable. And so the poor polynomial time reduction is just polynomial time. It cannot tell what case the graph is, initial graph is in, whether it's three colorable or not. But it has to do some operation to it such that, you know, if, um, if the graph is not three colorable, it really spreads out like the badness. So her analogy is like, you know, like you're given like a piece of toast. It has like a teeny spot of jam on it, potentially. Or maybe it has, like the jam is like the badness. Maybe it has no badness but maybe it has like a teeny tiny spot of jam on it. And you're not allowed to look at the toast, but you have to do like some operation um, which will spread out the jam if it exists. So the operation is to just like somehow in real life, you know, take your knife and like just rub it all around the toast. And then wherever like the badness, the tiny bit of badness is, it gets like spread out. But of course, if there is no badness at all, then, you know, rubbing, rubbing your knife all around the toast doesn't do anything. I don't know if that uh, analogy helps. I probably only gave like a poor version of like, uh, Irit's version of this analogy, but I liked it. So uh, her proof uh, goes not by trying to prove this in one shot, but by sort of the slowly, gently method of building up to it in stages. So the main thing she proved, and what the main thing that we'll try to sketch, is a badness amplification theorem that looks like the following. So this is a new theorem, which is going to apply the PCP theorem. It says, there are universal constants, epsilon zero, and some big constant k, and a polynomial time reduction r. This r will not be the final r, but some polynomial time reduction r. That maps three coloring instances to three coloring instances. So it takes a graph g and outputs a graph g prime with three properties. So property one is that um, the size blow up is just a constant factor, this fixed constant k. And when I say size here, I really mean like the number of bits it takes to write down the instance, which is basically like the, you know, the number of edges and vertices in the graph. So this reduction will, you know, take a graph and produce a new graph that has more vertices and edges, but everything will be within like a fixed constant factor. Two, uh, it'll have, you know, the classic property of these reductions, just that if the graph G is perfectly three colorable, then the output graph G prime is also perfectly three colorable. But the main property, well, together with the first property, is this, that this reduction R increases the badness by a factor of two. Well, you can't literally say it always increases the badness by a factor of at least two, because, you know, the badness could, you know, can never be at most one. In fact, for three coloring, the badness can never be more than one third, because there's always a coloring of the vertices that falsifies or violates at most one third of the edges because a random coloring will have this property and expectation. So, you know, if the badness is already high, then you cannot like make it go up by a factor of two, but it says as long as the badness is lower than this epsilon naught, this fixed constant like 1% or whatever, this reduction R like at least doubles the badness. Okay, that's not inconsistent with bullet point two, by the way, because, you know, if, if badness of G is zero, it stays zero. So this only increases the badness by a factor of two. Whereas, you know, in the PCP theorem, we want to get it up from one over M to epsilon zero constant. You can probably guess how this is going to go though. Um, the key aspect of it though, is it's really strong on this. It only blows up the size of the instant by an absolute constant factor. So perhaps you can uh, let me know in the chat, like how you would take this badness amplification theorem and 
use it to conclude the PCP theorem. Repeat amplification. Yes. How many times should you repeat it? Keep an eye on the chat window here. Log M. Yes. Very good. So this uh, badness amplification theorem uh, implies the PCP theorem because, you know, to get this final polynomial time reduction, given your graph G, you just do this reduction R that doubles the badness like log M times. Okay. And you you know, do it log m times, and the badness either stays zero the whole time in case one, or in case two, it starts out at one over m, but after doubling it log m times, it gets up to this universal constant, basically this point, you know, at which it stops doubling. And what's great is here it's very critical that the size blow up is only like linear. The size blow up is this constant factor k to the power of log m, Log m, you know, the number of edges at most the number of vertices are squared. So like log m and log n are the same up to a factor of two. So the overall size blow up is a constant to the power of order log n, which is poly n, which is great. So all the time you're applying this, you know, subreduction r, everything is staying polynomial size all the way to the end. So definitely a cool strategy, which is quite different from the original strategy uh, for proving the PCP theorem, which involved like, I think it involved like two recursive steps instead of like log m recursive steps. Great. So uh, the goal for the rest of this lecture is to sketch this uh, proof of this badness amplification theorem. Okay, so if there are any questions, uh, please do uh, let me know. So uh, the Nurse method for proving this is also really cool. She does not do it uh, just in one shot, one big reduction R, but her reduction R is a combination of four steps. One, degree reduce. Two, expanderize. Three, power. Four, mini PCP. So I'm gonna to talk to you about all of these steps, but um, these are four uh, algorithms, reduction algorithms that you put them all together, they achieve this badness amplification algorithm R. And uh, some of these steps are more important than other steps. So these first two steps are kind of straightforward. I say straightforward, I mean, I'll sketch the proof of like them. Um, they won't be that straightforward, but they were kind of known already, or like, well, these are standard sort of ideas by the time Denor proved her theorem. Uh, the main step is this power step. This was like our main innovation. This is actually the step that really does this badness amplification by a factor of two. This power step is the main innovation. It's very cool. And, um, you know, it only works to increase the badness by a factor of the two if, you know, your underlying instance has been expanderized. So that's like the whole point of steps one and two is to sort of turn your CSP into like an expander CSP, and then this power step will work. But this powering step screws up some other parameters. So it increases the badness by a factor of two, but as we'll see shortly, like it sort of ruins several other aspects of the reduction. And then this like mini PCP step like fixes some of them. And uh, this mini PCP step was also sort of partly innovation uh, in Dunor's proof as well. Um, it was partly an innovation, partly kind of already known. So also cool, but like this is the most cool bit and what we'll spend the most time talking about. And I should mention that, okay, this, this overall R is reduction from uh, three coloring instances to three coloring instances. But uh, as you do these steps one through four, in the intermediate stages, you will no longer have a three coloring CSP. You will have different kinds of CSPs. These will actually still be binary CSPs, meaning that um, each constraint will vol involve exactly two variables. And therefore, it will always be good to think of these CSPs as like graph CSPs, where like the variables are vertices and the edges are constraints. It's just that the constraints might not just be like the standard coloring constraints, like, you know, the two endpoints should get different colors. That's the coloring constraint. They can have much different, they'll have different constraints. And in fact, the, even the domain will get larger as we go along, well, throughout these steps are. Uh, particularly the, the powering step will change the domain kind of drastically, meaning that you won't be assigning just red, green, blue to the vertices. You'll be assigning like, you know, from a bigger label set to the vertices and you'll have like complicated constraints, uh, binary constraints in your CSP. Um, so that'll happen sort of in the intermediate stages of one, two, three, four, but you know, 
Uh, at the end of four and at the beginning of one, you have a three coming CSP. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you the overview of like what the point of each of the four steps is. And, uh, but I won't say how to do the step. And then uh, we'll see that if we can implement each of these steps, we'll get the badness amplification theorem and hence the PCP theorem. And then I'll tell you some details about each of the four steps. Okay, so the first one is uh, degree reduce. And uh, this takes a CSP, a three coloring CSP G and produces another uh, CSP G prime that actually will still have domain size three. It'll still have like red, green, and blue as its labels, but it'll have both not equals constraints like in three coloring and also equals constraints, which is different from three coloring. So the main uh, point of this part of the reduction uh, as you might guess from the name, is to reduce the degree of the underlying graph. So the sort of starting graph here, G, could have any degree. It doesn't have to be regular. It could have some vertices of degree N. It could some, have some vertices of degree root N. It could have some vertices of degree three, whatever. The point of this degree reduction will be to clean things up so that the underlying resulting graph, G prime, uh, that should say becomes nine regular. I don't know where the word regular went. Okay, so at the end of this, every vertex will of degree uh, nine, i.e. it'll participate in exactly nine constraints. Uh, there's nothing overly special about the, the number nine, just some fixed small constant is the point, but the way I decided to describe it, it was gonna be nine. Hmm, yeah, this is funny without the word regular. Anyway, uh, so that would be the effect. Now, unfortunately, this, uh, oh, there's a question I'll get to in a second. Um, unfortunately, this uh, uh, reduction that gets things down to degree nine, nine regular graphs will have some side effects that we'll have to tolerate and fix uh, later. Okay, let me check out the question. It says, do all known proofs incur a log n blow up in the size of the output graph? Uh, I'm not sure where you say, oh, do you mean for the final uh, blow up in the PCP theorem? So with this version of the PCP theorem, the final blow up is like a huge polynomial because you, you know, multiply by this factor k, which might be like a million, um, it's actually much bigger than that, uh, log n times. So the blow up is like n to log a million. So n to a huge constant. Um, we mentioned last time that like Moshevitz and Ross have like have a better version where the blow up is quasi linear. It takes instances of size n, it produces instances of size uh, n to the one plus little of one. Mm, I think the smallest known log little of one factor, actually I'm not sure what it is. I think it's poly log n. But um, it's a major open pro problem, actually, whether you can have like a linear size blow up in the PCP theorem. That's unknown. Good. So let me, uh, hope that answers the question. Uh, let me get to the side effects. So, uh, okay, one side effect of this degree reduction is the size of G prime is bigger than the size of G by a constant factor K1. That's totally fine. We're planning on blowing up size by constant factors, so that's no biggie. Um, this reduction does not change actually the size of the domain, but it does add equality constraints, as I mentioned. So this new CSP G prime has both, you know, edges labeled not equals and edges labeled equals. So you're trying to make some edges bichromatic and some edges monochromatic. Um, it has a property that preserves perfect satisfiability. So if G is perfectly three colorable, then this new G prime will also be perfectly satisfiable. And all the steps, all these reduction steps are going to have this property. So I'm gonna basically stop mentioning it. You can assume all the reduction steps have this property. And the final property is that um, the badness of G prime will always be at least the badness of G divided by some potentially big constant C1. Now this looks funny because it looks like the badness could also actually go down by a constant factor. Like imagine C1 is 100. And it's true, this, can, this operation can make the badness go down by a factor of 100. And the whole point of capital R is supposed to be make the badness go up by a factor of two. So what's going to happen, and you'll see this uh, over the next few slides, is that um, you know step one and step two and step four actually make the badness go down by a constant factor potentially. So that really hurts us. But the point is that the powering step is going to make the the badness go up by a big constant factor that we can tune in such a way that the overall badness change will be increasing by a factor of two. 
So basically, we're going to tolerate this badness because we're going to fix it, this badness drop, because we're going to fix it in step three. OK, so that's degree reduce. Uh, next step, expanderize. Um, so expanderize also takes a CSP, this new kind of CSP with red, green, and blue as the labels, but some equality and non-equality constraints. And the point of expanderize is to output like a new CSP G prime, which will still be a binary CSP, but the sort of underlying graph, the point is it'll be an expander graph. And uh, again, it'll be, you know, um, regular for some fixed small constant, which in my version of the story is 17, but again, don't worry too much about this. So the point is after step one, you got down to a, like a regular graph, like an eight or nine regular graph or whatever, um, but it might not be an expander. And after step two, it'll be an expander graph. And like in order to expanderize, you need to have a constant degree graph. So that's why you did the degree reduction step. Just to remind you, what is an expander graph? Uh, it's usually defined in terms of eigenvalues being an expander. So, um, you know, it means that the, you take the graph G prime and it's normalized adjacency matrix K, as we've called it, you know, the maximum eigenvalue is always one, and you're an expander if your second largest eigenvalue is bounded away from one by some constant. And it'll again be, you know, bounded away from one by some mystery constant like 0 0.0001, but some absolute constant. Another definition of expanders that's equivalent, as you might remember, is that like every smallish set of vertices has a lot of edges of the graph touching it. So the graph has large minimum conductance. So that's the main effect there. It's setting you up so you can do this power step. And it has some side effects that are the same as the side effects as in one. So uh, the size goes up by a constant factor, and the badness actually goes down by a constant factor. OK, let's expand our eyes. Now the main step, the powering step. And you'll notice that I've actually stuck in like some parameter here, t. So this is a user-selected parameter. The reduction can choose it. And it will eventually be an absolute constant. but T is sort of the amount by which the powering operation increases the badness. So you're going to take T large enough, a large enough constant, to overcome all the badness losses in steps one, two, and four. Right, so what is the main effect of this powering reduction? It's to increase the badness by a factor of T. Okay, and actually it's, you know, it's like it's kind of funny. It doesn't incre increase it by exactly t. It increases it by a factor of t divided by some other universal constant, c3, which, I don't know, again, might be like 100 or something. But, you know, you can always overcome that fixed c3 by making t a larger constant. And also, as before, right, like, I mean, the, boundness, the badness is always at most 1. So this cannot be literally true. It's only true if the badness is already smaller than this fixed constant epsilon 0. And by this way, this epsilon 0 will basically be 1 over t where t is whatever constant you choose. You know, so it's preventing you from uh, you know, getting more than a badness, which is a fixed uh, constant less than 1. So uh, that's the main effect, and that's the main power to increase uh, this uh, uh, badness. And it's like called power not just because it's like a powerful step, but um, it's sort of like graph powering. It's sort of like you square the graph, or it's even more like you um, raise the graph to the power of t. So like um, the edges uh, are like length t paths sort of in the input graph. But we'll get to that. So this one has some side effects too and some kind of worse side effects. So uh, it increases the size of the instance by a factor of 2 to the order t. But t is going to be a constant. So 2 to the order t is just a constant. Um, so that's fine. We don't mind constant size increase. Um, even more notably, uh, the label set in our, you know, CSP used to be of size 3, just red, green, and blue. But the CSP output by this powering operation will have a pretty ginormous label set. Uh, I use uh, omega, as always, for the, the, the domain or the, the label set of a CSP. It'll have size that's approximately 3 to the power of 18 to the power of t. So that's big. But remember, t is a constant, so it's just a constant. Uh, so that's fine. And not only will like the, the label set, you know, the thing that you're trying to assign to the vertices in the output CSP G prime be very large, but the constraints, which constrains two variables, will be quite elaborate. I mean, well, they're just fixed constraints on, you know, uh, two variables and label sets of this gigantic size, but they're kind of complicated. 
OK, so that's powering. And the last step is mini PCP. And the main thing uh, aspect of that is to like get you back from this crazy CSP type with huge domain and weird constraints back to uh, the three coloring CSP. So that's the point. The main effect is to get the domain size uh, in G prime back down to three and back down to three coloring constraints. And you might even like kind of see, I mean, I'll talk about this a little later, like why this step is called mini PCP. You see, we're, we're starting from like a CSP where like you have these binary constraints, but they're super complicated constraints. Like these things that the, you know, these constraints that are being checked on the labels are very complicated. So complicated, you might you know, need to encode them by like a big circuit. And we're kind of replacing these by just the simple three coloring constraints. And that's kind of like what the PCP theorem does, right? It replaces this complicated circuit sat thing with like a three, three coloring uh, CSP. Well, we'll come back to this. Um, okay, and this one has some side effects too. Uh, this is like the awesomest side effect. Um, the size goes up by a constant factor of something like two to the two to the two to the order T. So merely triply exponential in T. Um, still constant. I guess this is a good time to remind you that the name of this course is CS Theory Toolkit. Um, and I should emphasize that, you know, the point of this proof is just to prove the theorem to show that all these constants exist. It's like ridiculously inefficient. Um, you know, you can make this merely doubly exponential with like not too hard of a trick. Um, but as I mentioned before, they're actually not through Denor, well, actually, yes, through Denor's proof and some other coding theory based ideas from the original proof. They're like very practically efficient versions of the PCP theorem these days. But you know, the point of this lecture is just to prove the results in theory. So great, two to the two to the two to the order t, still a constant. And as in steps one and two, uh, this step has the feature that it makes the badness go down by some universal constant factor C4, but we've seen that before in steps one and two. So that's the description of all four pieces of uh, the reduction R that achieves uh, badness amplification, this factor two badness blow up while only blowing up the size by a constant factor. And so putting all these four steps together, I you know, notated here like, you know, it takes a three coloring instance G and outputs a new three coloring instance G quadruple prime after passing it through these four steps. And what are the overall effects? Well, we go from a three coloring instance to a three coloring instance, great. The size of the final instance is dominated by the last step. So it's like at most two to the two to the two to the order T times the input size. But we haven't selected the parameter T yet, we still get to. And what about the badness? Well, if you put all the badness statements together, um, every one of the steps loses a universal constant factor in the badness, C1, C2, C3, C4. But step three, the powering step, gains a factor of T. And you get to choose T yourself. Um, so you can just take T to be like C1 times C2 times C3 times C4 times two to get out this factor of two. And you accomplish the theorem. So T is just a constant happily, and uh, the size blow up is also a constant. Okay, and all the reductions are polynomial time, and the instance size stays polynomial even after all like the log M application, uh, applications of this badness amplification theorem. Okay, so this is a great time to stop for questions, because what I'm going to do in the next, um, well, in the last half of this lecture is just kind of give you a sketch of how each of the four steps of the proof works.